Webinar Tuesday with Seared Equipment Company. Today we'll be doing choosing the right technology, I'm sorry, choosing the right blower technology for your wastewater plant. I'm Jerry Conley and I'm with Seared Equipment Company. A couple of housekeeping items similar to the previous weeks. Uh, during the presentation, there'll be, uh, I'm sorry, six multiple choice questions to answer by poll vote. So click on the answer you think is correct. We'll post the results and then we'll move on to the next uh, slide. To receive your, whether it's PE or operator credit for this webinar, you have to complete the poll questions during the presentation. Now that said, every once in a while we've been running into a technical problem. If you do specifically two things, one, try to not maximize your screen, all right, not minimizing it, but not maximizing it, if that makes sense. And then if that still doesn't work, just write down your answers and either in the, uh, questions or chat box or just via an email afterwards send an email to sherry mcnamara and she'll make sure that they're part of the submission in addition please feel uh, free to type in your own questions anytime in the questions drop down arrow in the drop down box and we will answer them at the end of the uh, seminar um, you must complete the evaluation that will show up at the end, so please stay connected until you complete the evaluation. We have to submit that to the state to get the PE credits or, or, and the operator credits. You also need to download the certificate of completion, and you can do that any time during the presentation. Please don't wait till the end of the presentation. Uh, you have all the entire presentation to do so. Once we close out, you can't have access. You can't get access to it, access to it anymore. Sorry. Uh, as a reminder, this presentation has been given at uh, a, a host of engineering firms throughout New York State in the last couple of years. Paul's been made a couple trips here, so it's it's incumbent that you check and see if you have already received individually received a PE credit uh, for this uh, this seminar. With that, that wraps up the announcements. Uh, I'd like to introduce Paul Peterson. He's our presenter for today. Paul is with Atlas Copco. Paul, take it away. Thanks, Jerry. All right. Today, we'll have a brief introduction on blowers and history of blowers and wastewater. And then we'll talk about the individual technologies. First, we'll discuss high speed turbo blowers, direct drive. Then we'll discuss in year cool turbos, multi state centrifugal blowers, rotary screw positive displacement blowers and tri blowers. Uh, we'll talk briefly uh, about automation and building blower systems using two different technologies on the same system. And then we'll wrap with general selection criteria. So first, why is this important? Well, an estimated US energy consumption is used for water and wastewater services. So hey, Paul, given the hey, Paul, energy hey. sources in the US, Hey, hey Paul, it's Jerry. Can I interrupt you for a minute? Sorry, you're you're yeah. coming through. You're coming through a little sketchy on the uh, on the audio. Is there any anything we can do differently? Uh, I could try to switch to my computer microphone. One second. Let me know if this is better. Give me a sec. Jerry, can you hear me? Uh, better or worse? Uh, actually, I think that sounds better. Let's let's give it a shot. I hope won't have to inter interrupt you again. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. All right, three percent of energy is used for water and wastewater services. About a billion megawatt hours per year, or two hundred eighty billion per year. Uh, and then, given of energy sources in the US, that's 195 million tons of greenhouse gas every year. Blowers use between 50 to 70 percent of the electrical load in a wastewater treatment plant. So that adds up to about 200 million megawatts a year or a million tons of greenhouse gas per year. So if you can find a way to reduce lower energy consumption in wastewater by percent in the US, uh, we can pull 100,000 tons of greenhouse gas out of the atmosphere every single year or reduce energy consumption on our grid by 20 million megawatt hours. That brings us to our first poll question, Gary. 
OK, so the first poll question is. Aeration blowers typically account for this percentage of a wastewater treatment plant's total energy consumption. So go ahead and answer. We'll give it, you know, 15, 20 seconds. Couple more seconds. We have over 80% have voted so far. And we've got 85%. So we'll close. And the correct answer is 50 to 50 to 70%, and almost 80% got it correct. Paul, back to you. All right. Blowers themselves uh, are over 160 years old. They're actually an American invented by the rulers. Here they are on the left in Connorsville, Indiana in 1856. And ever since the introduction of the activated sludge process at the turn of the 20th century, blowers have been a staple uh, in the water and wastewater treatment industry. So we have several different technologies. For the first 100 years, it really was just the P low blower or the root blower, as it was known then. That's actually the original patent drawing in the lower left. It wasn't until about the 1950s that we saw the introduction of multi-state centrifugal, which is a dynamic compressor. compressor. Then in the 70s, stage gear centrifugals came into play for the largest. And then in the early 2000s, the introduction of the high-speed turbo and the rotary screw blowers We've now got more options than ever before available to us when selecting lower technology for wastewater treatment. If we look at all those technologies on one big family tree, we've got the dynamic compressors or centrifugals on the left side, the multi state centrifugal, the high speed direct drive turbo, and the centrifugal. And then on the right side, we have the positive displacement rotary screw. And the lobe, the bi lobe, most of what we see today, where there are still a few manufacturers of the bi lobe or two lobe blowers out there. Hey, Paul, it's Jerry again. I'm sorry to keep interrupting you, but it, I'm not sure if it is any better. Let's switch back to the other mode. And all I can say is let's just do our best. Everybody, um, you know, this is the way technology happens sometimes. So why don't you switch back, do our best, and uh, we'll proceed from there. Or Paul, is there a way you can just call in on your cell phone and do it? Sure. That might be better if you separate the two. Bear with us for a minute, folks. All right. Can you hear me now, Jerry? Sherry? Yeah, it just it, it sounded great. It's, make sure your uh, computer audio is off. That way you're not echoing. Did he just follow you there? I'm here. Okay, perfect. All right. Let's, let's rock and roll. All right, if we look at the centrifugal technologies, uh, in the upper right, we have the high-speed turbo. These generally start at about 100 horsepower and go up to 500 horsepower. The multi-stage blowers probably have the widest range of any of the technologies we'll discuss today, starting around five horsepower and going up to the thousands of horsepower. Then the single-stage integrally geared centrifugal blowers uh, are what I like to call the big iron. They generally start at about 200 horsepower and again, go up into the several thousands of horsepower. With the positive displacement blowers, uh, in the upper right, here we have a newer technology and that's a rotary screw blower using a permanent magnet synchronous motor. Uh, these are available for some manufacturers, including Atlas Copco. 
is the big benefit of permanent magnet motor technology, which we'll get into a little bit later, is the constant power factor or constant efficiency. The motor has a flat efficiency curve and a wide turndown range, and the rotary screw blower has the widest turndown range of any of the technologies we're gonna discuss. So when you put the two to together, it's a very efficient blower across the entire operating range without having real sweet spots. Uh, of course, you can also get a rotary screw blower with a regular induction motor, TEFC motor. These generally start around 25 horsepower and go up to about 500 horsepower. And then finally, in the center, at the bottom of our screen, we see the low blower, which is uh, generally one horsepower, sometimes even fractional horsepower, up to 350 horsepower, sometimes even higher. If we put all of those technologies on one big working area map, this is our PV diagram where we have pressure on the y-axis and flow on the x-axis, we can see that the positive displacement blowers dominate the low end of the curve. Then when we get up to around 5,000 CFM, um, roughly 500 horsepower, uh, we make a big jump into just the centrifugal technologies. So we got the PDs on the low end, high-speed direct drive in the middle, and then the geared centrifugal and the multi-stage in the tens of thousands of CFM. First, focusing on the high-speed turbo, we see the heart of the unit, the blower itself, coupled directly to a permanent magnet motor in the upper right. And then we have a photo of four blowers installed directly side by side. So this concrete pad is roughly five feet deep and 13 feet long. And those four blowers have, are capable of delivering approximately 13,000 CFM of air. So due to the compact nature of this blower, you're never going to get more CFM per square foot of floor space with any other technology. This is the most compact. They always come with variable speed controls built in. That's because they run on permanent magnet motors, which need a VFD. They can't run on regular 60 hertz power out of the wall. They've got a small footprint, low vibrations, so there's no special foundations required. These also have the lowest noise levels of any of the technologies we'll discuss. Because of the integrated controls, these are plug and play machines, so they have easy installation. This technology also has one of the highest peak efficiencies. So at the design point of the impeller, these are extremely efficient, and because there's no gearbox or belt, there is no drivetrain losses. Your blower impeller is mounted directly on your motor shaft. And because these use non-contact bearings, either magnetic bearings or airfoil, which we'll talk about in a few slides, there's no oil required. So there's no oil changes, so they're very low maintenance. And when you use magnetic bearings, they have extremely high reliability. So the one drawback of this technology tends to be that it has a higher capital cost compared to most other options. But not all turbo blowers are created equal. Um, most manufacturers use permanent magnet synchronous motors. Uh, these are very common, 100 horsepower and up, uh, where instead of having windings in your rotor and stator, you have copper windings in your stator only, and then the motor rotor is embedded with permanent magnets. So those magnets create a synchronous field that spin the motor round and round. And because of that, they have a constant power factor, as opposed to a regular induction motor that has an asynchronous field, meaning it has a variable power factor, which is another way of saying variable efficiency. So with a permanent magnet motor, you have a higher peak efficiency, and then you maintain that efficiency across the whole operating range. Some of the smaller turbo manufacturers, ones that go below 100 horsepower, are typically using uh, induction motors in their smaller horsepower machines. And when you spin an induction motor up to 20,000, 30,000 RPM, you're not getting a 95% efficiency. It's more like 90 or 92 
And again, when you turn that motor down, you're losing even more efficiency. There are also different ways to cool your electronics in your motor. Um, typically, the VFDs provided for these blowers are usually liquid cooled. Uh, there's only two or three manufacturers of these VFDs. Two of them require liquid cooling. Uh, and then some motor manufacturers use a liquid cooled motor. The benefit to this is you have a lower operating temperature, which gives you a higher efficiency, less heat rejected into the room. And more importantly, it allows you to maintain a constant operating temperature. So even on a hot day or a cool day, you always have the same operating temperature of your motor, which means you're allowed to machine the tolerances inside the motor to as close as possible because you control the rate of thermal expansion. When I'm able to keep that magnet very close to that stator wall, I have a higher efficiency in my motor. On a hot day with an air-cooled motor, I've got to account for a greater rotor swell. So with an air-cooled motor, you have to have a wider tolerance between rotor and stator meaning your motor is not gonna be as efficient on days that it's not peak temperature. Another thing to be careful of is, although liquid-cooled motors have a higher efficiency, they do require a coolant system flush roughly every five years. That's a very small maintenance item. But on the air-cooled motors, some manufacturers suck in cooling air to the package and cool all of the electronics and then use that air to compress and send into the process. There's a few problems with that design. Number one, typically the bugs in our basins don't like being cooked, and when you preheat that air 20, 30 degrees, your discharge temperature is gonna be 30 degrees hotter coming out. Uh, the other problem is that when we heat that air before compressing it, we have now expanded that air before we take it into the blower and try to compress it. So that's an inherently inefficient process. So what you'll see is motor manufacturers who have air-cooled motors often show shaft power on their data curves, uh, which is not actually what you care about. Uh, at the plant level, we pay for kilowatts coming out of the wall, which is package power or wire power. So you got to make sure you're comparing apples to apples when you look at different data sheets. The big difference in turbo blower manufacturers, however, is the bearing technology. Magnetic bearings were actually invented first uh, in the 90s. Those were European invention. So most European manufacturers um, like Salzer and Atlas Copco use magnetic bearings. So these are able to handle higher loads. So larger blowers, larger impellers, heavier weights. They're more efficient, uh, better aerodynamic efficiency, and they don't require any replacement. You have truly unlimited starts and stops because when the blower is turned on, the shaft is levitated before it ever starts spinning. And when you come to a complete stop, the shaft stops before it ever sets down. So there's never a risk of contacting metal on metal with a magnetic bearing blower. With airfoil bearings, these are less expensive to manufacture um, and tend to be about 10% cheaper to purchase, but they require regular replacement of the bearing based on the number of starts and stops. The way this bearing works is we spin the shaft up to roughly 10,000 RPM and create roughly 4 PSIG back pressure, and that's how we create lift. So we pull the air from the top of the shaft to the bottom and lift the blower off the airfoil bearing. Once we're above that minimum pressure and speed, we float along nicely unless there's some pressure spike or process upset, they tend to work very well. But every time you start and every time you stop, you're dragging that metal shaft on that metal bearing inside that metal housing from 10,000 RPM down to zero and from zero RPM up to 10,000 again. So it's just like that old Tootsie Pop commercial from the 90s with the owl, how many licks till you get to the center of the Tootsie Pop. If you don't proactively replace these bearings, then eventually they will deform due to that constant friction and heat from the starts and stops. And that very thin metal becomes a liquid weld and typically welds the shaft to the housing. That usually means the blower impeller touches the volute or the casing. And then of course, 
this shaft is also our motor shaft. So we've just come to a screeching halt and fried our windings. Therefore, that entire heart of the machine, the blower and motor, needs to be replaced. And that's typically about 60% of the original purchase price. So although airfoil bearings are less expensive to purchase in capital cost, uh, the first time you have to replace one of these bearings, it would have been cheaper to buy the magnetic bearing technology. So as a manufacturer who's made both in the past, uh, there's a reason we have stopped manufacturing the airfoil technology because we offer better reliability and lower life cycle cost with the mag bearing. Another benefit of mag bearing technology um, is in the control and regulation. So in a normal centrifugal, especially turbo blower system, you have a control gap. So from minimum speed, zero to that 10,000 RPM, uh, we're basically blowing off. We allow the blower to come up to speed and develop that pressure before we load the blower and deliver air to the basin. And then we get up to maximum speed. There's usually some small CFM difference between maximum speed of one blower and minimum flow of a second blower. So if our DO point is somewhere in the middle, we have to alternate between over aerating and under aerating. This creates a phenomenon known as DO hunting, where we can't maintain an exact set point because of this control gap. And it also causes a large number of starts and stops, which as we just discussed, is not a good thing with an airfoil bearing. Well, the solution to that, when you have a magnetic bearing, is you can actually modulate the blow-off valve. Instead of venting all of the air in between machines, if we have two blowers running and we're slightly over aerating, Instead of shutting one off and under aerating with a single blower, we can actually choose to vent only a portion of the air. So by using a modulating blow-off valve, we can vent only 10% of the air if only a 10% reduction in flow is required. This allows us to maintain a constant DO level, eliminating the control gap and eliminating that DO hunting. And that brings us to poll question number two. Poll question number two. How many licks does it take to get to the set? No, I'm just kidding. Poll question number two. Magnetic bearings offer which of the following benefits over airfoil bearings? Couple more seconds. I'll give you a hint. Back when I was in high school, anytime I saw all of the above, I used it. All right, the answer D, all of the above, 98% got it correct. Nice job. Whoops, what did I do? There we go. All right, now the integrally geared centrifugals or the single stage centrifugals, these are, as I said before, the big iron. The way these blowers work is typically the most common installation uses inlet guide vanes, as we see the cutaway of the element on the upper right. Coming in from the right hand side is our blower inlet. We've got these yellow guide vanes that turn in order to control the flow of air into the impeller. The impeller spins that air up to speed and then these variable diffuser vanes adjust to maintain our exact discharge pressure. So the use of those two guide vanes in combination delivers very laminar flow, meaning low pressure drop, maintaining a high efficiency across the operating range compared to the other centrifugal technologies. So these are, in general, the most efficient style of blower. They can do air or gas in very large volumes, but they typically have the highest capital cost of any technology. They're very large. They're typically shipped to the site in pieces to be field directed, so they have a higher installation cost, and of course, a very large footprint. So here's a look at the inlet of the blower itself. Those are the inlet guide vanes, as I mentioned earlier. Normally, these are controlled uh, by the use of a hydraulic cylinder or linear actuator. And 
if people have a complaint about this technology, it's typically the maintenance required with that actuator or cylinder. Like any hydraulic cylinder, it requires a lot of maintenance, and if it breaks, the blower can no longer control its flow and pressure. So it's a very critical component. One thing that Atlas Topco does a bit differently is instead of using a linear actuator or hydraulic cylinder, uh, we actually use small servo motors to control the position of the guide vanes, eliminating that large point of maintenance. We also use a horizontally split gearbox. The big benefit of this is when you're dealing with a very large piece of iron like this, you don't have to get a crane, pull the blower out to replace the bearings and gears. You simply remove half of the split gearbox and you're able to access the bearings and gears without having to disassemble the whole blower drivetrain. Also using split bearings allows you to replace the bearings much quicker. You don't have to pull the shafts as we mentioned before. So that split gearbox, split bearing allows you to reduce the amount of maintenance. So with the geared turbos, we've got a generally high capital cost and a large footprint, but a very, very high efficiency. Full question three. I understand that the poll question was delayed a bit, so I'll try to keep it up a little longer. Geared single stage centrifugal blowers offer which of the following benefits? A, low capital cost, B, small footprint, C, high efficiency, D, all of the above. Give me another 10 seconds. C, high efficiency, 57% got it correct. And those that listen to me about D, all and the above, just stop listening. Paul, I think we're back off to you. All right, the multi-state centrifugal blower. Uh, as I said before, this technology's got the widest range from very small flows uh, and low pressures up to tens of thousands of CFM at much higher pressures than we need in wastewater. It's a very versatile technology. It can be controlled similar to the geared centrifugal in that you can throttle the inlet uh, with a multi-stage, we do it with a butterfly valve instead of those fancy guide vanes to lower capital costs. And you can also use a VFD. Now, obviously, the VFDs are only used on the smaller horsepowers, um, but they do offer an efficiency benefit over the inlet throttling. The nice thing about the multi-stage is it's uh, an average investment cost. It's more expensive than any of the PD blower technologies but it's the lowest cost of any of the centrifugal blowers on the market. These can also do air or gas in vacuum or pressure and handle small or large volumes, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, two of the drawbacks here are the high installation costs, similar to the geared machines. A lot of the accessories that we see here with these inlet filters and silencers and throttle bells are all field erected, so you've got a higher installation cost. And again, these are physically long machines, so they got a very large footprint. But really the biggest benefit of this technology is its simplicity. It is a single shaft with a bearing and seal at each end, a small volume of lubricant uh, to keep those bearings spinning and requires very little maintenance. Every five to 10 years, you replace those bearings and seals but this technology tends to last longer than almost any other. It's not uncommon to see multi-state centrifugal blowers that are 25 to 50 years old still operating in the field. So really, the biggest benefit of this technology is its long equipment lifetime.
here's a look at a complete package assembled. Uh, so we've got an inlet filter here at number one, comes down into a inlet throttle butterfly valve, electri electrically actuated into the blower inlet, driven off a direct drive coupling, spins through each of the stages and out the other side. Some of the protections that are common for this equipment are bearing temperature and vibration sensors to detect surge and protect the machine, and also a blow-off valve assembly. So similar to the turbo blow-offs we talked about earlier, that's an option on the multi-stage blowers as well. When it comes to controlling the multi-stage, we've got three options that vary in efficiency and cost. The lowest cost is just using that blow-off assembly. Somewhere in the middle of cost and efficiency is inlet throttling. And then the most efficient and most expensive would be using a VFD. So if we look at the curves for a multi-stage blower, we'll say that our operating point of this blower, if we just turn it on, it's going to produce about 1,000 CFM at 8 PSI. But our design point where we want to be in our system is 800 CFM at 8 PSI. So how do we get to our design point? We've got 200 CFM in excess, so we can just blow off that 200 CFM. I still use 100% of the power and get 80% of the air. It's easy, it's cheap, but it's very inefficient. And you pay that power bill every month. So the alternatives use the inlet throttle. This gives us the widest turn down because it maintains a high rise to surge. Rise to surge is a term used in centrifugal blowers only, and it is used to indicate the delta between our operating pressure and the maximum pressure possible. So the top of the curve and our design point. So we see here by throttling the inlet, we maintain a high rise to surge. That curve, the peak of the curve doesn't come down at all. That means inlet throttling gives us the widest turn down. But the drawback is that inlet throttling will save us 20% in flow, but only about 10% in power. The most efficient method is to use a VFD. With a VFD, we're able to reduce the speed of the machine, which brings that curve towards the origin here. So we save 20% in flow and 20% in power. The one drawback is by the curve moving with the VFD, we have a lower rise to surge, as we can see here with this yellow curve, meaning we can't turn down as wide with a VFD as with the inlet throttling. So one of the, ben one of the drawbacks of multi-stage technology is it has a narrow turn down range, the narrowest of any of the technologies we're gonna discuss today. So that brings us to poll question four, Jerry. Multi-stage centrifugal blowers offer which of the following benefits? A, wide turndown range. B, long equipment lifetime. C, small footprint. D, all of the above. Give it another 10 seconds or so. I'm sorry, did I just go one too far? Multi-stage, what's the final benefits? B, I'm sorry, yes, I'm, I apologize. B, long equipment lifetime is a correct answer. 56% got that correct. Paul, back to you. All right, now we'll discuss positive displacement blowers, starting with the rotary screw technology. So we can see here, uh, the rotary screw typically goes down to about 150 CFM and up to 5,500 CFM approximately. Some manufacturers a little more, some a little less. But one thing you'll notice is that the screw blower goes to a higher pressure than most other technologies. Uh, this nominally 22 PSI or one and a half bar, meaning it can squeeze internally to 50% higher pressure than the atmosphere. So municipally, 
that doesn't tend to come into effect here in the United States, but in places like Asia and Europe, where they're very densely populated and they don't have room to expand their plant's capacity outward, they need to build their tanks deeper. And when you get that deeper tank, you need to have higher operating pressures. And so that's where this technology really shines. Also industrially, uh, if we have an industrial manufacturing plant that has wastewater treatment and they've increased their plant's throughput and capacity, they typically don't have room to expand their wastewater plant. They need to just fill their tanks deeper. So again, uh, the rotary screw is a great option when you have a higher than average operating pressure or a deeper than average tank. Here is a look at the machine with permanent magnet motor. We can see how compact that is on the back of the gearbox here. The nice thing about rotary screw technology is it is also available as a plug and play machine, just like the high speed turbo direct drive blowers. So all the controls, all the accessories are included inside the box. That will give you the low installation cost. These also have low noise levels. So these are not quite as low noise as the high speed turbos, but they're certainly much, much quieter than the positive displacement lobes and are generally a few decibels lower than a multi-stage or a single stage centrifugal, depending on the operating point. As I mentioned before, the biggest benefit of this technology is its extremely wide turndown range, the widest of any of the technologies we're going to discuss here. And it has a very high operating efficiency, especially compared to PD blowers. Um, this is typically in line, depending on the design point, um, with the high speed turbo. Not as good as the gear turbo, but certainly much better than the lobe and typically much better than the multi stage as well. So the one drawback is it is more expensive than the lobe blowers, typically about 20% more, but still much less expensive than all of the centrifugal blowers on the market. So it still has a relatively low capital cost. Here's a look at a machine with TEFC induction motor. Um, and you can see here, it's got all of the components uh, that are typically associated with PD blowers, uh, as it is a positive displacement machine. So you do have two rotors, uh, which means four sets of bearings and seals. Those have to be overhauled every five to 10 years. Um, and then of course you do have oil to change uh, because of those bearings and gears. But the nice thing about this design from Atlas Copco is we use a gearbox drive. So there are no belts to change. There is no risk of misaligning the belt after you do an element overhaul. And you have a higher efficiency with the gearbox drive that never deteriorates over time, unlike a belt drive. Next, we'll look at the lobe, and then we'll look at the two in a side by side comparison. So, the biggest benefit of positive displacement lobe technology is its low investment cost. It is by far the lowest capital cost piece of equipment. It also has a good turndown, roughly about 50%. It can do air or gas in vacuum and pressure. It's been around over 150 years, so you know it works. Um, a lot of times people just buy a bare blower and field customize their package. There's a whole cottage industry of packagers that do this for a living. Um, but of course, you can buy the entire scope of supply in a plug and play version from any reputable manufacturer as well. The drawbacks of the lobe is it is the least efficient technology by a fairly significant margin. Now, if you've got a small blower, 25 horsepower or under, Energy efficiency is typically not a large concern. You're never going to pay back on energy costs with small horsepower machines, which is why things like aerated grit or small, uh, more rural plants still use this technology because it definitely has its place in lower horsepower applications. Another drawback, though, is it is the loudest by a very significant margin. It has the highest noise levels. And again, if you're not buying a plug and play package, you may have to erect some things on site, so they've got a medium installation cost. Here's a look at a plug and play package with integrated VFD, similar to the rotary screw or the high speed turbo. Here you have a belt drive. It's not very efficient, but it is much lower cost. Um, so you have to replace your belts every year. Uh, you've got two to five years between overhauls on the element, typically six months between oil changes, 
And then obviously with any of these technologies, you've just got to replace your air filters when they're dirty. But the nice thing in the industry is almost all blower manufacturers and packagers have filter clogging indicators as a standard feature. So the machine at least tells you when the air filter needs changing. Uh, for oil changes, sometimes you've got to keep track of that yourself. We'll look now at the operating principle behind a PD blower. It's a phenomenon known as external compression. So we see our PV diagram with pressure on the Y and flow on the X in the upper left. And then we've got our cutaway view looking at the tri-lobe rotors in a PD blower on the right. So from four to one, we intake air at the top of the blower at nominally 14 and a half PSI. And then from one to two, that's this light blue pocket in the cutaway view. We push that air from the top to the bottom. When we get to two to three, where the red dot is in our photo on the right, we're discharging at our higher operating pressure. This is where the actual compression takes place. It's actually outside of the blower in the discharge silencer or in the pipe, which is why it's referred to as external compression. So that discharge pressure is whatever your static head is in your tank or your process. And so that blue rectangle, WT, is actually the power consumed by a PD blower. So the concept behind the rotary screw blower is quite simple. We reduce the volume. We use internal compression by squeezing the air between the rotors inside the blower. We cut this green triangle out from under the curve and that is your energy savings. So at about seven PSI, that's roughly 20% energy savings. And with the rotary screw blower, that's typically the lowest operating pressure we recommend. But once you get to eight or nine PSI, you've got about 30% energy savings. And at 10, 11 PSI and above, you can save 50% in energy with a rotary screw compared to a rotary load. And here's a look at a bench test between our Atlas Copco 100 horsepower rotary screw and 100 horsepower rotary lobe. This is specific energy ratio on the left, that's joules per liter in metric, or it would be horsepower per CFM in imperial units. And then we've got bar on the X, but I went ahead and converted those values for us. So again, it's at seven PSI, 20% energy savings, at nine and a half, 30% energy savings, and at 11 and a half, 50% energy savings, and just increasing from there. So I like to say, the more you squeeze, the more you save when it comes to rotary screw technology. And I wanna point out that these are proven wire to air energy savings. So that's actual wire power, including all of the package accessories, your filters, your silencers, your valves, and the controls. So the VFDs, starters, control valves, control panels, all of that is included in ISO 1217 Annex E. That's the test standard for wire to air power on a positive displacement blower. So here's a look at the comparison again of that lobe and a screw blower. So the wide turndown range of the screw is 80 to one, or sorry, 80% or five to one meaning a 1,000 CFM screw blower can go down to 200 CFM, whereas a rotary low would typically stop around 500 CFM. So here we see on our power and flow curve, in black, the rotary low stops much sooner than the screw, and it has a higher horsepower consumed across the whole range. So in addition to consuming less power in the normal operating range, by being able to turn down 30% lower, we gain 30% process control. So we don't have that DO hunting we mentioned earlier. And by going to that lower flow, we're using significantly less power. So by turning down 30%, we're saving 45% in energy operating at that lower flow. So again, the screw is in generally low capital cost machine, more than the low, but less than the centrifugals. It's got that wide turn down range and it's got a high package efficiency across the whole range. And then the noise level on the screw is typically 
about 10 decibels or 15 lower than the rotary lobe, and it's about five to 10 decibels higher than the high-speed turbo. So when we look at the screw compared to the lobe, um, you've got lower noise, wider turn down, more efficiency uh, for a similar cost, um, but in general, the rotary lobe blower is always going to be your lowest cost option. Which brings us to poll question number five, Gary. Thanks, Paul. Rotary screw blowers offer which of the following benefits? A, low capital cost, B, wide turndown range, C, high efficiency, D, all of the above. <clears throat> I'll give a couple more seconds. Okay, we have 94% of the votes in. We'll close it. D, all of the above, 63% had the correct answer. And Paul, we'll go back to you. All right, and we'll go to poll question six now. Whoops, sorry. Well, question six, positive displacement blow, low blowers offer which of the following benefits? A, low capital cost, B, low maintenance cost, C, high efficiency, and D, all of the above. This is positive displacement low blowers. A couple more seconds. Okay, we're at 92%. A, low capital cost, and 64% got the right answer. Paul, back to you. All right, so in general, when it comes to selecting the correct blower for your wastewater plant, there are several general guidelines you can follow. Uh, the first of which is that if it's a variable pressure application, like an SBR or a tank whose water level is not controlled by a weir, and you're gonna see pressure swings in excess of two PSI, you want to avoid the centrifugal blowers. Centrifugal blowers, just like centrifugal pumps, have sweet spots on their efficiency curve, and each impeller is cut to a certain design point. And as you increase and decrease pressure, you're getting away from that design point, and you're losing efficiency of your blower. Whereas with a screw or a lobe, positive displacement technologies, you're always delivering a constant volume of air regardless of the system pressure. That makes them very easy to control in variable pressure application. And pressure and flow are dependent variables. So you're not losing any efficiency with the changes in pressure. Um, for gas applications, we're using sour gas um, for odor control, um, maybe using sour gas off of a digester or some sort of tank to blow into aeration. You're gonna to want to avoid the newer technologies. Those tend to be more efficient, but also to be more sensitive to those VOCs and corrosive gases like H2S. Uh, something like a high-speed turbo blower has got a lot of electronics with a lot of copper. Copper and H2S don't mix. And of course, with the rotary screw, you've got a very tight tolerance between rotors that that gas will slowly eat away at losing efficiency, um, making more heat. So use a low cost option such as a rotary lobe or really the best application for a multi-stage centrifugal. 
um, typically digester gas exhausting or flaring or combined heat and power systems are usually uh, controlled by a multi-stage blower because they are the best at handling sour gas. Then, after those two tips, it really comes down to your operating point. What is your flow and design pressure for your site? So below 100 horsepower or 1800 CFM-ish is the land of the PDs. So you want to use a rotary load blower if you're cost conscious, or you want to use a rotary screw if you're worried about efficiency. Once we get over 100 or 150 horsepower to 2000 CFM and above, there the rotary screw is going to be your low cost option and the high speed turbo is going to be your more efficient option. Once we get to four or 500 horsepower around the 5000 CFM mark, that's typically when we have to switch to medium voltage on our power supply and medium voltage VFDs are not only extremely expensive, but they're extremely large in their physical size, making them impractical for most applications. So the multi-state centrifugal and the single-state centrifugal are the two technologies that can vary their flow rate without the use of a VFD. Therefore, when you get above four or 500 horsepower, the multi-stage is a good option if you're capital cost-minded, and then the integrally geared single stage blower is going to be your best bet for high efficiency. Then, as far as pressure ranges go, if you're below seven PSI, it's not a good fit for the screw. You're gonna lose that efficiency benefit. You're gonna squeeze the gas to seven PSI and then expand it back out if you're at a lower operating pressure. So if you're below seven PSI, typically, a lobe or a multi-stage is still going to be a good fit. Uh, once you get 7 PSI to 1 bar, uh, nominally 15 PSI, of course, if you have high elevation, uh, your atmospheric pressure is a bit lower. But that's typically where we see 90% or certainly 80% of municipal water and wastewater applications is the 7 to 15 PSI range. And any of these technologies will be a good fit. And then, of course, in those rare scenarios where you've got a very deep tank or you're at a very high elevation, then the rotary screw becomes sort of the only game in town above one bar or 15 PSI. So with that, we've reached the conclusion of the presentations. If you have any questions, uh, please enter them in the question or chat box, and Sherry will read them off, or Jerry. Yeah, I didn't see any questions. There were some technical issues early on. We appreciate you, everybody, uh, working through it with us. For no technical questions. There is one question on there, Jerry. Oh, did I just did I just miss it? Sorry. Yeah, it's at the very bottom. Uh, what other blower manufacturers offer large intricately geared centrifugal blowers? Um, well, the the original manufacturer was uh, HV Turbo um, in Europe, and that became Turblex, Siemens Turblex, and is now owned by Howden. Um, so Howden and Atlas Copco um, are the two largest, but there are several other manufacturers out there that are much newer. Um, if you do a Google search for geared single stage centrifugal blowers, you could probably come up with a host of manufacturers. Um, that uh, that now make those technologies that are a bit newer, but in general, Howden, Atlas, Copco, and then there are a few others. Thanks, Paul. I don't see. Okay, here I'm sorry. No, now there are a couple are more coming in. Air intake versus air in the room. What do you suggest? It is really a matter of preference if you're going to do a piped or ducted intake from outside um, or if you're going to draw from the room. Typically drawing from the room is gonna have the lowest capital cost. Um, and depending on which blower you're using and which manufacturer you're working with, in winter, blowers put out a lot of heat that tend to warm the room. Even if you're bringing cold air into the room, they tend to stay 20, 30 degrees warmer than outside. Um, again, a lot of the times you can just put a simple 
louvered intake fan on the wall and then have a louvered outlet fan on the opposite side of the room that brings air across the blowers. Uh, in summer, you keep both open, so you're rejecting that hot heat. And then in winter, typically close the outlet fan and louver. And so you're drawing in pressure that's being compressed, but then all the heat that the blowers put out stays in the room. So it really depends on preference uh, on how you'd like to do it, but either one's a good option. And then one more, Paul, what about combining technologies? I'm not sure if I, that's the extent of the question, so maybe you can answer if you, if you understand it. Yes, uh, so that is an excellent question, um, actually, which we didn't cover much on due to time, but there is a growing segment of uh, the blower industry that really supports combining technologies using a centrifugal and positive displacement on the same system. Uh, that's because centrifugals are available in all sizes, whether it be a multi-stage that's small, a turbo that's mid-sized, or a geared centrifugal that's very large, and you use those as your baseload machine. So you don't need VFDs or the expensive controls. They handle the base aeration load of a plant, and they operate at their sweet spot for efficiency. So you park a centrifugal in its sweet spot, and it operates 24-7. That gives you high efficiency and low maintenance. And then as your plant has increasing air needs, as DO starts to drop, diurnal loading increases, you bring on either a rotary screw or a trilobe to handle the trim aeration for the varying loads. You use the full wide turndown range of the PD machines. These tend to have higher maintenance, but they're lower in capital cost. So by combining technologies on a single blended blower system, as we call them, you tend to get the best of both worlds on lower capital cost, lower maintenance, and better efficiency. I think that's the last of the questions, Paul. All right.